Hey folks, Todd Coburn of Cal Poly Pomona with Arrow 4080 and I have a little supplement from our Zophis session on how to solve beams when they have constraints. So this kind of picks up right in the middle of our discussion so it's not real clean but hopefully it gives you a little bit of help. Enjoy. Okay, I think we're recording now. Alright, so we're, I'm going to back up just to here. We're working problem uh, homework 10 problem two, and we set up our system of equations. We have uh, our force in the Y at node one, the force, the moment in the Y, we have the force, moment, force, moment, and over here we have the deflection, rotation, deflection, rotation, deflection, rotation. When we're done eliminating our knowns, we get rid of our first and second rows and our first and second columns, we end up with a reduced system like this. We first solve the system with uh, a zero deflection in node uh, for, for node two. We first solve with that and we remove that one and we look at the deflection of node two like Mr. Ortiz was, was saying before and we find out the deflection is greater than that constraint. Now if the deflection was less than this constraint, we would have been done and used all the rest of the solution as if it was completely free with no constraints. But what Mr. Ortiz says is when he did that, he got a deflection greater than 0.5 inches. That means we're now constrained. So we back up and we reset up our equations. And now we still have these four relations, but now this V2 is constrained to 0.0, excuse me, to 0.5, right? Okay, now we're looking at the coupling. This column here is what multiplies against this value. If we look at row four here, we see that this is a zero, which means anything that happens here is zeroed out. That means that four is already decoupled from a row three. What we're wanting to do is eliminate row three from our calculation. We find that rows five and six are coupled because they have values here. So what we're gonna do is write an equation to get rid of the coupling. So we're gonna rewrite, we're gonna rewrite Annie equations that are coupled with the one the row that we're removing the row that we're removing are you with me are you still with me did i lose you there by backtracking no no you got me so what we're going to do how do we do that we're going to say f3y we're re we're just writing out equation five f3y equals we'll call this uh let's see what is this this is one two three four five is this five three and this is six three this is five four six four five five six five five six 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 did i write those correctly yes. i think i did okay so f3y and what we put here i explained earlier anything with an x has a value i'm just not telling you what the value is anything with a zero has a zero you should find that on your own okay yeah. so we're going to do is say okay f3y equals x three three times v two right plus x is that a three what is this here we're doing four five four. oh this is not three this is five right this is a five three yeah five three this is a five four times v two plus x five five v three plus x five six v three right okay then what we're going to do is we're going to take this term here and we're going to bring it over there so we're going to rewrite it and we're going to say f3y if we put in here f3y minus x five three v two equals the rest of this crap then this thing is zero. We just took this term out by changing this. Do you see that? Yeah. The rest of the stuff is all the same, right? Mm -hmm. The rest of it's all unchanged. And over here, we rewrite this equation, M3Z, and what we're going to end up doing is saying M3Z is minus X63 times V2, right? And right. the rest of this crap is unchanged. Now we have a zero here because we've moved this term and this term over here. 
we've moved them over by rewriting that. Now we can, we see, look, this is completely uncoupled. We can go and solve this little system equation here with these terms and these three to solve for our three unknowns. Then we can multiply that out to get our val any values we need over here. And then we can go and use that to go and, uh, let's see, was there anything else we need to get? We can go and use that. Once we have these values here, then we can just solve this equation to get what this reactive force is. Okay. So the basic approach is, in this case, because it wasn't yet a constrained problem, we solve it as an unconstrained problem and see if we violate the constraint. If we don't, we're done and could take our results. If we do violate the constraint, it now becomes an enforced dis dis displacement, not that it was enforced, but it was stopped from going beyond that value. And because the load caused it to get to that value, it now can't go beyond. So that's what the deflection is. We treat it like a, uh, an enforced displacement. The constraint problem is treated like an enforced displacement at that point. We set up our system of equations. We look at the one, we're gonna eliminate the row that has the constraint. And we do that by moving by eliminating the column that couples with that row. We do that by rewriting each equation and basically moving the term in that column multiplied by the constraint over into the uh, applied forces. So now that applied forces, external forces column becomes a force plus or minus constraint column that reduces our system. We decouple the system we now can solve the decoupled part of the system. It's not really the reduced system anymore. We've dropped part of the reduced system because we've now gone to the, we decoupled the system so our reduced system is even smaller. We solve that mother. Once we have that solved for those cons uh, constraining forces or reactive forces or displacements, I guess we're getting displacements in this case. And uh, then we're gonna take those and we're gonna plug those values in and resolve the equation. The equation that we removed still has an unknown reaction by plugging in those constraint values that we just calculated, we can get that. That's the approach, does that make sense? Yeah. You Thank had you. this like three minutes ago or something, right? Is that beautiful or what? Yeah, yeah, that makes that makes a lot more sense. I, I didn't think of it as the uh, the column with the zeros going through it before. So that makes a lot more sense now. Yep, excellent. So we see in that video, that Zoffis session, that when we have a constraint, we're gonna reduce our system of equations in the normal way. We're gonna reduce our system of equations and then we're gonna look, and for the one that has an imposed constraint, we're gonna look whatever column acts on that constraint value needs to be zeroed out. The way we zero it out is by moving that column over into our applied forces. So we're gonna have stiffness values that are gonna multiply by deflection values. So basically whatever applied force for any given row minus the stiffness times the deflection becomes the new term in the applied forces. That leaves a zero in the corresponding spot of the stiffness matrix. That's gonna allow us to decouple that equation and reduce our system of equations even further. Often, we will then solve that reduced, reduced system of equations using our approach for simultaneous equations. Sometimes, like in some of the homeworks, once we've reduced to that level, we can just take each into equation individually and then solve for whatever value we're missing. Either way, we can handle it. Now in homework number 10, there was another little nuance because this wasn't an imposed constraint uh, in terms of a boundary condition, it was a constraint. So it wasn't, that constraint didn't pick up unless we deflect enough. So first we have to solve the problem as an unconstrained problem with just the other 
fixed constraints. And then we need to look at the deflection value where that little gap was. If the deflection at that point is less than the gap, then there's no constraint with that kind of loading. If we actually go beyond that and the deflection is larger than the gap, then the constraint takes effect and that means we redo the problem a second time as if there's a constraint. Since we know that it would have deflected past that, we now impose that constraint. Even though we're not pulling it to that, we're basically limiting it at that value at that point and then solve the system following what was just presented. Make sure you understand this. I recommend you redo homework 10 if you didn't get that problem 2. If you don't understand that, it's critical that you understand this. Enjoy.